Hello friends, today I'm going to show you how to upgrade your Macintosh Color Classics internal mono audio to stereo simply by adding a second internal speaker and amplifier circuitry. Now I know what some of you are thinking, why not just take a pair of great sounding external desktop speakers like well, these Apple design powered speakers, model M6082, and use these connected to your headphone jack on the Color Classic, since they will certainly sound much better than a second teensy tiny speaker just due to the physical size of them and the power of the amplifier. And if you have the speakers, and if you have the desktop space required to accommodate them, then yes, overall, it's going to be much easier to do that and less costly too. But the entire point of adding a second speaker inside the Color Classic is not only to give you better sound, but also to maintain the same beautiful compact form factor that requires no extra desktop space at all. Here's the parts list for the stereo mod, which I've divided into three sections. Easy to buy, don't need to buy, and bothersome to buy. On the left, you see CS3, CS1, CS5, and so on. These are silkscreen markings that appear on the Color Classics analog board. CS3 is equivalent to the existing capacitor CS4, CS1 is the same as CS2, and so on. I've put a link to a Mauser card of these capacitors, resistors, and the Velcro for you in the text description below. You don't need to buy RS2 because it's already on the board under the pads RS7. You just desolder it and move it to RS2 pads. And then the last two are IS1, which is the amplifier IC, and then uh, SS1, which is the speaker in the case that we need to add. Here's the data sheet for the amplifier IC. Even though the AT version chip seems to be for 16 ohm speakers, Apple chose the higher wattage A chip, despite the fact that the Color Classic has a 16 ohm speaker. This chip is powerful enough to drive either impedance. You can find the A version chip on eBay for a rather expensive price. You can also find it on AliExpress for a very cheap price, although if you take a look, the missing logo kind of leads you to believe that this might be a fake knockoff chip. You can also find it on UT Source for a very reasonable price, although the shipping cost varies wildly by country, for example, in the United States, you're lucky enough to have USPS shipping. I'm not sure how they do that from China, but probably China Post, uh, $7.61. But for other countries, it can be extremely expensive. For example, shipping to me in Japan, the cheapest <laughs> shipping cost would be $27, which makes no sense at all unless you have uh, a large number of other chips that you'd like to buy from them. Instead of buying the amplifier IC, I'm going to extract it from this LC575 parts machine. I bought this monster of a Mac for one reason only, to extract its 68040 motherboard and put that in my Macintosh Color Classic. It provides a fantastic performance boost, so if you've not seen my Color Classic Mystic upgrade video, be sure to check that out. But this dead carcass is still useful because on its analog board, we have the same exact amplifier IC that's found inside the Color Classic. So I'm going to pull that board and desolder the chip for you now. With the motherboard and back panel already removed, I need only take my Torx T15 screwdriver to remove the single screw on the bottom here, then remove these two screws here and here, and two more screws on the other two corners of the CRT. The case now slides off very nicely. Discharging the CRT is easy. Just make sure the power cord is disconnected. Then take a flathead screwdriver and a wire with alligator clip leads at both ends. So you can put one on one end of your, the metal part of your screwdriver. And then the other end uh, needs to go here on this ground wire area. There's a big piece of metal that this ground wire is connected to, so make sure it's on there firmly. It's not going to come off. And then we want to put our wire, uh, we can peel it back with the fingers, that's okay. Just don't stick your fingers deep down inside of it. But uh, we're going to put this tip on the inside, and once we touch, then it's discharged, but we need to press down on it to pull out uh, the little clamps that are on the inside. And that can be a little bit hard, 
but I've got one of them out now. And then it's easy to pull out the other one. Next, we disconnect this cable here. We take off our discharging wire. And there are two grounds, this wire and this wire. We need to disconnect both of these. Now, because we want to pull out this analog board, we need to disconnect this cable. This is the power switch and power cord area. We need to use our flathead screwdriver again, and we're going to leverage it by pushing this little tab, and then we're going to pull up while wiggling to remove this connector. And then we have to untwist the little holder here. It just uh, twists twists together, and then we can pull the wire right out. I have already sliced through this gray silicon with an X-Acto knife, so all I need to do now is carefully pull off this video board straight back with no twisting motion, and uh, you don't want to break the glass here. And it's very easy. And now we just need to disconnect this cable. It's not locked in, so you're going to have to wiggle it. Not too hard, just pull him straight up. Now we want to pull our analog board this way, but there are connectors over here and there's these little fins that push down. So what I found to be helpful is to try to get a little flathead screwdriver in this gap and just twist a little bit, not, not a whole lot because you need to do the same on the other side too. Here's the other side, we just twist a little bit. Let me get our finger in there. And there's, it's slotted in here in these grooves. It's not too difficult to just pull it up and out. And here is our analog board. It really does look a whole lot like the Color Classics analog board, doesn't it? It's just scaled up in terms of some of the components for the larger CRT. And uh, here are our two amplifier chips down here, uh, just in the same area where the Color Classics analog board is. Our two amplifier ICs are soldered in here. So what I'm going to do is apply a little bit of flux and then use my smaller chip puller because my professional tool is too wide to go in and see if my hot air station can handle that just fine without me having to remove any of the solder. So we're just going to see what happens here. Okay, might as well do the other one. And here are the two chips. After a nice bath in 100% ISO alcohol, we only need one of these, but uh, it's always nice to have two just in case one of them is bad. Okay, I have the Mauser parts and the amplifier IC, so all that's left is just for me to acquire the second speaker. Now you have three options to do that. The first option is to find a junked Color Classic parts donor machine and remove its speaker. That may be easier said than done because those machines have a fair amount of value and you're probably better off spending time to fix them up than to part them out. Option two is find a comparatively cheaper vintage Mac, such as a Quadra LC Performa branded 630 machine uh, and remove its speaker because it's the same exact shape and size as the Color Classic speaker. And that's what I did. Then you have option number three, which is something newer that came available more recently. And uh, that is to buy two brand new speakers of the same size and to 3D print the case. Now the upside to option number three is you don't need to tear apart a vintage Mac. And uh, on the 68K MLA forum, forum member Jagman uh, very kindly created a 3D file of the speaker case and made it available for anyone to freely download. He also created a second version of that 3D file without the little tab on back, which could aid in mounting. If you go with option three, be sure to see the text description below because I put a link for you there on where you can download that 3D file. I also put a link to Jagman's PayPal page just in case you'd like to send him a thank you.
Now his 3D case is useless without a speaker 70 by 30 millimeter to go inside, but the good news is that you can buy these brand new in an 8 ohm version from Newark, Farno, and Element 14. If you choose option 3, you want to be sure to buy two of those 8 ohm speakers to get balanced sound because the speaker inside the Color Classic is 16 ohms. Now yes, the amplifier I see can drive either impedance, but you want to make sure that you have either two 8 ohm speakers or two 16 ohm speakers to ensure that the amplifier will produce the same volume level in both speakers. Now at the end of 2021 when I was sourcing my speaker, option 3 was not available to me. So at the time I followed the kind advice of my good friend Kay Koba, who is the proprietor of the fabulous vintage Mac store Caro's Mac Mods. And Kay told me, you know, just go on Yahoo Auctions and buy a cheap Performa 630 machine and ex extract its speaker. And that's exactly what I did. And I paid a whopping sum of 4,000 yen, uh, which at today's exchange rate is about 29 US dollars. And that including the shipping too, <laughs> which was a fabulous deal. So I just bought it and removed its speaker. So here's some footage of my teardown of that 630 machine, which I filmed back in January of this year. So what I'm going to show you now is how to take it apart to extract the speaker. And to do that, to begin, we want to remove the front bezel. And normally you will put a screwdriver into these two holes here and push to take off the front bezel. But actually this is broken already. And the seller on Yahoo Auctions put, actually had to put tape on it to hold to hold it in place we can see the broken piece has already fallen off so it's not going to be very difficult at all to get it out of here boom voila <laughs> all right and then the next approach is we need to take off on here on the um, this side of the machine there is this little guy here and we'll use a flathead screwdriver to insert it in the side to pry a little bit, a little twisting action. So we can slide him right out. And there's a connector here. Now normally there's a metal bracket that goes here to cover the hard drive, but there is no hard drive in this junked computer. And there is no metal bracket and there is no screw for us to remove. But in your case, if you're going to do the same as I am, you would need to remove that. Next, I will remove the floppy drive by pushing up and pulling right out. And what do you know? It's not even connected. Huh. And the CD-ROM drive is next. We push up on this tab. And of course, it's probably going to break. I can hear that plastic is pretty brittle. And normally we just need to pull him out, but he seems to be fighting us. It's connected in the back, so. Okay, heard a crackling sound there. He is not a fun one to get out. Okay, with a little bit of help from my screwdriver, pulling out on him. It's a way to achieve it. And now we have the back side where the power plugs in. And again, this is a busted machine, so nothing holding it on there. We'll just remove this little panel. And now with that panel removed, we have two tabs here that we just push down on. Again, these are very brittle, might break off. Now we have a couple screws here and here. And then we'll unseat this little handle here. See our little handle? This little, little guy lets us pull to remove the motherboard. And now I will remove a screw here in the upper right corner. And then this screw over here by the barcode. Take this panel right off. So here is the back. Here is the front. And this top panel slides, so I'm going to slide him towards the front. So he comes right off. And then the panel comes off easily. And on the flip side, just the same. And then we've got a screw here and here. 
Now, a fair amount of force. This is the back, this is the front, so we want to slide the top panel to the front. Again. Okay, and then there's some cables stuck underneath. There's a latch under here that's holding this cable in place. You have to squeeze it, pull down and push in. Basically squeezing it is pushing in. And then this little swingy wire thing comes down and allows us to take out the cable. And now we can remove the top. We have a uh, screw down in here. You have to take out. Then we can disconnect this cable. And then this is our speaker cable. It's fastened to the side here. Then we want to disconnect our power supply. And there's a support screw here by the fan. And we still have this cable coming out of here, so I probably need to remove this. Or I can just remove the cable. That's easier, maybe. And I still see one more cable over here. And here is what all the hard work has been about. I should disconnect. Let's get the cable out from here. Hooked in there. Ah. Oh. And then it should just be Velcroed on to come right out. Well, except for this black foam cushion, which I'm going to remove shortly, this speaker is identical to the Color Classic speaker. Uh, even on the bottom of both speakers, we can see they have the Velcro in two places. Uh, they both have little tabs uh, on each end. And actually the tab is going to be a little bit of a problem, which I'll show to you shortly, but uh, the same speaker driver size. Uh, wire length is a little bit different, but it's actually good that we have longer wire on our second speaker here. And both speakers, this is the very important part, are 16 ohms. This one, of course, is stamped 16 ohm, but I took my ohm meter and measured both to verify they are definitely 16 ohm. Now, I read reports that some people are opening their Performa or Quadra 630 machines and finding the speaker is actually 8 ohms. And if that's true, then perhaps you're better off to go with option 3, which is to buy new speakers, rather than option 2 like I did. However, if you already have an LC or Performa 630 machine, you don't have to do a complete teardown. As you saw in my teardown video, you just need to remove the top part of the case, disconnect the speaker, and then you can test those two pins in there to see if it's 16 ohms or not. If it is 16 ohms and you don't mind parting out that machine, then there you go. You've got the speaker you need. But uh, if it's actually 8 ohms, then what you'd need to do is, at the very least, buy one piece of the 8 ohm speaker and then put it in your Color Classics plastic case or, you know, 3D print the case or just do full option three and buy two new speakers and buy uh, and print out two cases as well. So now that we have all of the parts, let's proceed with the installation. As you can see, my Color Classic is completely disassembled with the analog board removed. Please see my VGA mod video for complete details on how to properly remove the back case discharge the CRT for safety, and then at the end of that video I show how to correctly reassemble everything as well. I was able to remove the little black foam piece very easily and use some ISO alcohol 100% to remove any sticker residue. You can hardly even notice it was there. I decided to cut off this wire harness and instead make one of my own because I wanted to have a pair matching uh, locking connector and I just had happened to have some of this wire. This wire is thicker than the stock wire and uh, so I wanted to make sure it's a nice twisted wire too so I hand twisted this myself and what I'm going to do is using my heat shrink tube and some solder just solder these tips to here. The shorter part of this cable uh, is 19.5 centimeters so there's nothing too magical about that that's just the length that I chose and then the longer part that's going to lead underneath the analog board uh, currently measures 44.5 centimeters. And then this part here will solder into the analog board itself. This is the stock speaker, which goes here on the left. 
And here is the second speaker. Now, if I just try to put it in here, just barely touching, the problem is that this speaker isn't going back far enough. And the reason why it needs to go back farther than this is because inside the back case, which is what you're looking at here, we have this T-shaped piece of plastic, this one, and then this one over here, which all must slot into the body frame as deep as they can go. So for example, here's the stock speaker, and we can see that piece of plastic is going to slot in just like this. And so, of course, the middle piece of plastic is going to slot in here, and then the flip side plastic is going to slot in over here. So you can see how the hard drive SCSI cable is sticking out quite a bit, and this. Now, this one's flexible. It can move down a bit, but this power connector is not flexible. It's going to stick out this much, so long as you have a spinning platter 3.5-inch hard drive in there. And if we try to put in the speaker, second speaker like this, well, that's not going to work for two reasons. You don't want to have the wires coming out over here because that's where that piece slots in, right? And, well, you can't really push it back any more than this because that power connector is touching this side of the speaker. So, what if we flip it upside down to make sure the the wires are out of the way. Well, uh, <laughs> even if you do that and push it all the way back, then the wire problem is solved for these two wires, but over here, it's still not pushed back far enough. Well, I spoke to my friend Kay Koba and he said he could fit his second speaker in there with a hard disk in there because the plastic piece on the back case doesn't slot in all the way down. So to confirm how far it goes down, what I did is I put some of this uh, green colored clay inside the slot and then I'm going to put the case on and see how deep it really goes down because that will tell me how far back I need to push the speaker. And Kay was right. It pressed it down to this part. I put a little felt tip marker black line here to show how far that back piece goes. And I see we have about three millimeters from the very uh, deepest part of that slot to the very start of my black line to where the back case protrusion plastic will not sink in. So basically I can put my speaker all the way up to that black line. Well, what do you know? After applying the Velcro and mounting the speaker with the hard disk in there, you can see that this right edge of the speaker just comes right up against that black dot that I made. And then we see that the SCSI cable nicely goes under. And this, is, this was the problem before. This power connector, it almost touches. So it's just like an exact fit uh, after having measured it. Great. So looking at it from the back, here is the wire that I made. It's actually a little bit too long, so you don't have to quite make it this long, but better, better to be a little bit too long than too short. And since the wire will come up from the analog board here, actually both wires, then I can connect them easily. Um, this probably is not going to, it doesn't seem to come up above these tabs, which is where the analog board slides. And since this is going to be hidden, I don't think it's necessary to remove them. But um, since this side Velcro won't be used, it could be removed. And then it's on there good. <laughs> it's on there real good. Uh, wow. Okay, <laughs> we can see why it's on there real good. I didn't do any precision measurements. I just put on uh, two pieces and, um, well, I put a fair amount on my speaker too. So I wanted to make sure that the speaker is not going to move around. And um, especially on this part, just because it's coming up right against it here. 
and just in case these wires stick out a little bit I wanted to make sure it's going to sit on there securely and we can actually verify that it's going to be okay by putting the speaker back in just right against that line here's the speaker here and then through this gap down here we can also see part of the speaker and so now keep your eye on this part as I put on the case right so and that's as far as the case goes on and if you had your eye on it you saw that this speaker didn't budge it didn't get pushed down so that's proving to us that that little piece of plastic over here is not touching the speaker looking at the component side of the color classic analog board we see this is the section we're going to modify I will be soldering in my amplifier IC here and then adding the electrolytic capacitor in right here I just need to pull these two tabs back and then slide the board this way to remove the bottom so here's the IC that's already soldered in there and this is where we want to solder in the other one we can't put in the IC yet though because I need to use my copper wick and remove the solder from the pads I'll go ahead and remove solder from these pads over here so I'll go ahead and put in my IC with the notch facing this way of course I have to flip it upside down and put it in from the bottom Next, I'm going to put in the 0.1 microfarad capacitor CS1 onto these pads here. By the way, this is a 1206 case size, but um, if you have an 0805 case, it probably is too small to fit the pads because you can see the, if I can ever grab him, the size difference between the larger 1206 and the teensy tiny. 0805 so you want to have the 1206 case all right I'll put a little flex here Okay, next I'll slide him over a bit because we want to do CS5, which is right here. And for CS5, we need a 3.3 nanofarad or 3,300 picofarad, however you wish to think of it. And yes, I am checking the values with my LCR meter so I'm not just trusting Mauser this is definitely was measured to be the correct value and I'll put a little flux on this Amtec flux I hate the dispenser it just keeps coming out coming out coming out no way to stop it but I don't want to waste it so dab it on there well that's probably good enough but I'll see if I can move him all right my rs1 pads have a little solder so that off there RS1 and that is our 5.1 kilo ohm resistor
Now I need to desolder RS7. This guy is 100 kilo ohms. Now I could probably use my hot air station, but I'm gonna see if I can. He's got a little glue on the bottom. So I'm just gonna see if a solder blob will do the trick. Maybe add some flux on him. Well, my solder blob isn't working, so I'll try hot air. Okay, hot air station set to 400 degrees. Let's see if I can get him now. Well, hot air makes it easy. All right, RS2, my pads are pretty clean, but let's give him a wipe. And yes, I did measure this guy. He is definitely 100 kilo ohms. Then on the component side of the board, I'm to put in our capacitor here to CS3. This is one microfarad. I think I should probably bend him down like so. Like that. And here he is. I'm going to push up on him from the bottom. And just for the sake of consistency, I removed this tiny cap. Same value, uh, shouldn't have been a problem, but uh, since I had two of these, I decided to, not simply for aesthetics, but uh, to make sure that their specifications were closer. I did measure this one and this one, and uh, the larger one is about one ohm less ESR, which isn't saying much because they're close to 14 ohms <laughs> anyway, which is normal for this particular capacitor, so two matching capacitors there. And our final step focuses on this area. Instructions I have read online say to drill holes in the same pattern as these two. You can see they don't use these three holes in the circuit board that are already there. Maybe because they're too small. And for my wire width, yeah, these probably are too small. But I will try to I'll remove the solder and see if they fit through. If they fit through, I don't see any reason to drill a new hole. Well, I'm able to fit my rather thick wires into the existing holes, so I see no good reason to drill any new holes into this circuit board. And here's how it looks with my wires soldered in and run through the hole. Thankfully, my connector fit through because I soldered them before I put the connector through. And I put some hot glue on both of the capacitors just to make sure they're not going to move around due to vibrations. And here's the analog board before and after. After putting the metal bottom back on, I routed both speaker wires up about in the middle and just put regular scotch tape to make sure they don't move around. I've got both of my speaker wire connectors right here easily accessible. It's then a straightforward matter of putting back the analog board. So we just slot the sticking out parts into each of the grooves and then just slide them in making sure I'm not getting any wires smashed. 
and it looks like all my wires are okay. Just push my, my, my thumbs to make sure it's secured at the back. Okay, that seems to be going in all the way. And uh, then it's a matter of uh, just connecting our speaker wires here. Left speaker. And the right speaker. I now have everything assembled. Please see my VGA mod video for the complete detailed reassembly instructions. Um, I have everything powered on now and I just wanted to do it with the case back off so I could more easily test. And the best way to do that, I originally connected both speakers but then I realized no, I need to connect them one at a time and then with the volume control on my mouse I can click and make a sound. So I have the volume turned up all the way and I have my left speaker which is the factory color classic speaker and that's the sound you just heard. So now I'm going to disconnect that so no speakers are connected. Clicking of course does nothing and then I'm going to connect the right speaker, the one that I newly installed and click and what do you know? It makes a sound which is what it's supposed to do and then if I connect my stock speaker again and click, now it's louder because I get sound out of both of them. Okay, so now I'm going to put on the case and then do more extensive testing. I now have the back case on and Snooper 2 loaded to run some audio tests. This is my Sony D100 professional audio recorder, which I'm using to record the stereo separation for you. Uh, trying to mimic what my ears are actually hearing sitting in front of the computer. Now the volume is max all the way up to 7 and the first test I'll do is both speakers. The audio is functioning correctly. And we pretty much knew that from the first test but that is playing the audio through both the left and the right speakers. Now I'm going to click on the left channel button. This is the left channel. And that's a problem because it's playing it over here on the right speaker. Okay, let's click on the right channel. This is the right channel. And it's just the opposite. It's over here on the left speaker. So I'm not sure why it's doing that. That was totally unexpected and unfortunate. Okay, well, let me just do these other tests. I've got 5 kilohertz, 1 kilohertz, 500 hertz, and 100 hertz. These are digital waveforms. 5 kilohertz. 1. 500. And 100. Now when I did 500, maybe you could see it, it fluttered, right? The screen, there's some kind of screen flutter. It's almost like there's noise taking place, or maybe it's an excessive power draw on the analog board. I'm not sure. But you could see that, right? Maybe it's power draw. Maybe it'll go away if I swap out the hard drive with a blue SCSI or a Mac SD, which I'm going to do a video on, so we'll be able to test that. Sine wave, 5 kilohertz. 1 kilohertz, 500, 100. Now you couldn't hear that 100 at all. Not too surprising, these speakers are small. Pre recorded 5 kilohertz, 1, 500, and 100. Now I could hear a little bit of that, but still very faint. No, no good low frequency response on these tiny speakers. So it's unfortunate. Uh, again, do the left speaker. <laughs> right, it, it did the, the, the one on the right, and then uh, I'm going to do the right channel now. The right channel. And it sent it over to the left. The fix would be that I would need to go in and change the locations of where the wires are soldered. That's a lot easier than changing out the connectors. So it's trouble, and I'm not going to do it in this video, but it's a learning experience. I had no idea it would do that. I never read anything on the internet that said it would do that, but clearly the stereo is reversed. Okay, here I've got Duke Nukem running, and this has stereo sound effects in it. And so what I'm going to do is show you what speaker it puts the sound into when I approach the fire. I'm going to approach it with the fire being on my right ear. And you can hear the sound is, of course, on, on the left side. And so if I go and turn around,
and now the sound is on the right side. But if I change the options in the game, sound flip stereo, I'm curious why this setting is here. Maybe other computers have the same problem? I don't know, but if you do flip stereo and click OK and click escape, now the fire is correct. It's on the left side. And if I flip around, so now it's correct on the right side. So you could fix it in some apps with software, but still, fixing the speakers to be correct is best. I just want to show you one other thing. Here I am and booted into Mac OS 8.1. And what I want to show you is the monitors and sound control panel is where you can change the resolution but and all of that. But what I want to show you is the sound section. And if you've seen this in OS 8 before, you'll probably notice that something is lacking here. Even though I put in the second amplifier chip, it doesn't seem to be true stereo insofar as OS 8.1 is not recognizing it. Normally with a true stereo sound setup, you're going to have balance between the left and the right speaker, and there's no slider there for that. There's the computer volume, but uh, there's no balance. So this computer is seeing the audio system, I guess, as monaural, two speakers, but mono, and therefore, it, I don't know, it, it's whatever reason, it's not giving the balance slider and other controls that normally would appear when you have a recognized stereo Mac. So that is somewhat of a disadvantage. Uh, and even in System 7, it's very stripped down. So you're not able to control the balance between the two speakers, unfortunately. Okay, I now have the Apple Design powered speakers hooked up. The one with the controls is supposed to be placed on the right. And the one without the controls is on the left. They're connected at the headphone jack in back. Uh, so it's just normal stereo. They shouldn't be flipped in any way, and that's why I'm going to leave uh, in this Duke Nukem game. Flip stereo turned off. And I'm going to turn on my recorder so you can hear how it sounds. Now, naturally, these are going to sound better because they're bigger, got a better amp, and they're firing straight at you. But look at them. They're honking huge. So again, this is the merit of the internal stereo mod is that you don't have to take up so much desktop space with external speakers. But anyway, here we go. Okay, so what you're hearing now is I'm facing directly at the fire, so it's the same fire crackle on both of the speakers. And now you can see my right ear is over here and you can hear the fire crackle only in the right speaker. Now, of course, it's on my left ear and you can hear it only on the left speaker. So as you can see, the headphone jack and anything connected to it, whether it be headphones, and yes, I tested that, or speakers, doesn't even have to be Apple speakers, it could be any speakers that you connect to it, are not going to have any reversed stereo problem. Uh, so basically when you're doing the mod watching my video, you're just going to have to um, disconnect the wires that are connected in on the stock speaker and connect them on the new amplifier you put in and then put your new speaker where the old speaker connections should go. You're just going to have to reverse the wiring and then you can fix uh, the reversed stereo issue. And as you may expect, in OS 8, the monitors and sound control panel is unchanged. It's not going to change just because you use the headphone jack. So this computer, the Color Classic, um, even if you add the second amplifier, there's no hardware support in OS 8.1 for it. And that's why you don't get the balance controls, unfortunately. And of course, I'll end the testing with Snooper 2 again, just to show you how the audio from these Apple Design power speaker sounds compared to the internal speakers. Then I'll turn on my recorder. 5 kilohertz square wave. 1 kilohertz. 500. 100.
These are sine waves, 5 kilohertz. 1, 500, and 100. And you can actually hear that. <laughs> and here's 100 with the synthesized sound. So you couldn't really hear these sounds, 100 hertz, with the internal speakers, but you can on these bigger speakers, of course. The drivers are bigger. 500 hertz. 1 kilohertz. 5 kilohertz. And at the bottom, these simulated sounds, I'm going to have to turn on the volume between 6 and 5 so it doesn't make my audio recorder clip. The audio is functioning correctly. Here's the right speaker. And the left. This is the left channel. So naturally you could hear the stereo separation better because again, these are bigger drivers, better amplifier, and they're firing straight for you. So just keep that in perspective. But again, look how big they are, right? So that's why we do the stereo mod, uh, to keep everything nicely compact and inside the color classic case. And you don't need these huge honking speakers externally. At this point, you're probably wondering, is the stereo mod worth it? And the answer to that question is, well, maybe. <laughs> so let's rehash some of the downsides and then the upsides to help you decide. Uh, the first downside is uh, it's not supported in software in that you don't get the left-right speaker balance slider, unfortunately. The OS just doesn't support this hardware mod configuration. The next downside is the overall volume and clarity and stereo separation, of course, is not as good as if you were to use dedicated high-performance external speakers like this. Uh, the next downside is much more subtle, and it's not really a major downside, but I have very good hearing, and sometimes when I listen really closely, especially when I did the snooper uh, test with multiple frequencies, there are some frequencies that I can hear more clearly some frequencies that just sound a little bit louder from one speaker than the other. And I was thinking, well, maybe it's because I didn't drill any holes over here. Now, on this is, this is the side that I installed the second speaker. And to drill holes, you would have to remove this shield to do it. But I did not drill any holes because I asked my friend Kay Koba, who's done this mod before, if he drilled any holes, and he said no. And the reason I asked him if we should drill holes at all is because on the stock speaker side, uh, right, just the plastic that's right up against the cone, there's a huge gaping hole there. And over here, there's just a couple little slots, slits in the plastic. And so I was thinking it's probably a good idea to drill the holes, but Kay said, no, you really can't tell the difference, especially when you put the case on because the, the audio from both speakers is just bouncing all around. And as you heard from the recordings in this video, it doesn't sound bad as it is. But it's just that, um, I don't know, maybe some frequencies will come through a bit more clearly uh, from this speaker if you do drill holes. So if you decide to do the mod yourself, you can make that decision on whether you want to take time to do the drilling or not. It's not going to harm anything to do it so long as you take off this <laughs> metal shield here and you can drill, I don't know, um, I would probably say six, seven, eight or more holes, however big. You don't want to drill so many that you um, harm the structural integrity of the frame, but uh, drilling some holes in the side to let the sound come out, maybe that would uh, improve things. But I just put that as a minor downside. Now let's talk about the upsides. Uh, the first upside is the overall maximum loudness of two speakers is much louder than one. And because the maximum loudness of the stock single speaker isn't really that much, it's, it's a noticeable improvement. So I think for that reason alone, this stereo mod is worth it. But there are other reasons as well. Uh, I would say that you, you really do notice the stereo separation, especially on stereo capable apps such as Duke Nukem 3D. Uh, and you heard that in this video. Uh, yes, we had the flip stereo issue. So you either need to swap the, the speaker locations or change the soldering locations of each wire pair. But uh, that's the separate thing, you know. Uh, that's not a big issue. So. Uh, the stereo separation, I mean, you don't get that with only one speaker, so that's another reason why you should consider doing this mod. Uh, yet another reason is you're gonna get bragging rights. How many people do you know who have done the stereo mod in the Color Classic? I mean, I don't know any, almost, well, except for Kay. 
And uh, I've read a few people's stories on the internet. Many of them are very, very old. So I hope my video will change that. I hope most of you Color Classic owners out there will, will follow in my footsteps. Uh, because it's not really that hard once you have all the parts. And again, I have the parts list uh, down in the text description below for you. So uh, bragging rights. Uh, also, uh, it's really a great project. If you're looking for a project to do, it's not nearly as hard as the SC Reloaded motherboard project that I worked on in a recent video. Uh, if, once, once you have all of the parts, it really goes quite quickly, actually. Uh, yes, you have to remove the analog board. You don't need to see my other video for that, but it's really not that difficult. And no, it's not going to end your life. You have to take some care, but you can discharge the CRT. You can. If you follow my video, you can do it. So uh, it's a worthwhile project to do. And the other positive for doing the stereo mod is that I think it will marginally increase the resale value should you ever decide to sell your beloved color classic. And that closes out this video for today, but before I close, I'd like to say a big thank you to Maro Asiaka Ferry and to Gavin Maxwell uh, for their very generous ongoing monthly PayPal support to this YouTube channel. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'd also like to mention, some of you are probably wondering, where did you get that nifty Bicycles for the Mind logo polo shirt? And I put a link to the vendor in the text description below. I don't get any kickbacks whatsoever for telling you that. It's just FYI for your information. And they have other colors of this. They have other logos that you can buy too. And I actually bought two of these, uh, one with a different logo, and you'll see that in a future video. But it's a pretty neat uh, shirt, so you might want to check those out. And stay tuned for more great videos, folks, because I have a video in the works that's going to cover Blue SCSI. Now, there's been a lot of other people who've done Blue SCSI videos, but my main intent for doing it is because uh, I know Eric Helgeson, and I know that there's been recent firmware updates, so I want to cover those. It really makes it into a much better project uh, product than it was in the past. And I also want to revisit, this is Mac SD, which is really high performance a SCSI to SD card solution. I've done a very, very detailed video on this already. Be sure to check that out if you haven't already. So you might say, well, why rehash it? And the answer is, well, the developer is putting together a pretty major uh, firmware update, which adds some totally new functionality. So I want to go over that in a video. And then of course, I've already talked to you about the fact that I want to do a video on the Apple IIe card. <laughs> which I need to recap and then, of course, install in this uh, Color Classic. And, of course, besides all that, there's so much more to do. Stay tuned, folks. It's coming all your way. Thanks for watching today, and have a great day.